things began teaching at NYU. Professor Jacobs has published 14 books and more than 100 articles on such topics as prisons and imprisonment, drunk driving, corruption and its control, hate crime, gun control, and labor racketeering. His most recent book is titled Mobsters, Unions, and Feds, Organized Crime in the American Labor Movement. He also published a book with Hamilton College professor Frank Anacarico titled Pursuit of Absolute Integrity. Uh, we will have Professor Jacob's presentation, and following that will be a brief question and answer period. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Joe, and thanks to the Federalist Society, and uh, thanks to all of you for coming. I would do a bit of this. I do probably do three or four of these a year, and uh, I enjoy going around and seeing the different law schools and meeting, uh, meeting the students and engaging with the students. Thing that the Federal Society is doing uh, in enlivening the intellectual atmosphere. Um, so, hate crimes is a topic uh, near and dear to my heart. I wrote a book about this uh, back in the uh, late 90s, the Hate Crime, Criminal Law, and Identity Politics. So, it gives you an idea of you know, what my take was that this really was, uh, was part of identity uh, politics. and. Uh, it, it really isn't a, a crime a problem. I mean, it's not, and, and that's what I'll talk about uh, in some limited remarks. In, in the olden days, when I first started talking about this, uh, I, it seemed to generate a great deal of anger and a great deal of hate. Uh, people got really mad at me, but uh, I think things have calmed down a lot. Uh, people seem much less uh, energized uh, or angry uh, about the topic. There was, however, a, a long uh, run-up to the passage of the federal hate crime statute. You rem may remember that in 2009, and uh, signed by President Obama. It was a culmination of a, uh, a long effort by the Democrats uh, uh, and, and uh, advocacy groups to make uh, hate crime into a, a substantive federal offense. <coughs> Politics of the, of the hate crime was very interesting. I mean, there's really, really no vocal uh, group that's opposed to hate crime laws. I mean, nobody. I mean, I mean, nobody is in favor of hate crime, but nobody comes out in favor of crime. Right. So. Politically, it's, it's, di it's, it's sometimes difficult for uh, politicians, even for academics, to say they oppose more criminal law. And that, that's why, of course, we have a constant accumulation of criminal law and a constant uh, accumulation and expansion of the prison system. But one part of the politics which is kind of interesting is that this, these hate crime laws are, are really uh, um, part of the liberal establishment's uh, agenda, pushed uh, for the passage of hate crime laws uh, very vigorously. Um, and yet, the liberal establishment is highly critical of mass incarceration, a big topic on, uh, on the criminal law screen, and having uh, over two million people in prison and jail, constant uh, criticism of that, of that situation of mass incarceration, and yet the hate crime law kind of shows that uh, everybody, uh, e even those who are opposed to mass incarceration, they have their favorite areas where they are happy to send more people uh, to prison. So let me, I, I just uh, I try to give you a, you know, a lay of the land here. What are hate crime laws? So not everybody knows that. They, are generally sentence enhancements uh, for crimes uh, that are committed uh, because of or on account of uh, bias uh, of the wrong kind, of the socially uh, condemned biases, uh, race, religion, ethnicity, national <coughs> origin. Uh, in the beginning, there was, uh, there was sharp uh, disagreement among the proponents of the hate crime laws as to whether the gender should count. The women's groups are saying, what are you talking about? If there's any group 
It is victimized by another group because of their prejudices against women. Uh, but the other uh, groups uh, uh, said, well, if we include women, that, that will swamp the category, right? And that would make all rape into all sex crimes into hate crimes. We don't mean women, we mean a different kind of crime. But eventually, and, and that had a split in the, uh, in the liberal uh, coalition for some period of time, but eventually gender was included, and then, uh, of course, there was a, a lot of debate about uh, sexual orientation. Uh, the early statutes, uh, people did not, the proponents uh, or the opponents uh, did not want to include sexual orientation. Um, not so much, not because they didn't think that, that uh, gay fashion was bad or could be criminalized, but they did not want to put uh, gays and lesbians onto the same status as other uh, victimized groups. That, uh, by doing that in this statute, it would be the wedge into expanding rights for gays and lesbians. I, I thought that was kind of ironic because it sort of turned these laws, which were intended to to be a a uh, uh, an initiative in, in, in building tolerance in, in the country, to themselves being a, uh, a controversy in. And, and granted for being intolerant, right? You're going to choose some, some prejudices, but not others, to be included in the law. And eventually, uh, uh, the uh, sexual orientation was included, and then other groups wanted to be included. Uh, the the, the uh, advocates, advocates, the, the dis disabled wanted, wanted people, crimes that are committed because of a person's disability to be included as a hate crime, and uh, age was included in some places, and this and that. It was very hard to resist groups that wanted their victimization to be recognized as, uh, as well. And you do have some funny things like union membership and uh, membership in the armed forces and so forth. So what we, what we have here really, um, at least in my view, is kind of a re- criminalizing the conduct that is already criminal. Right? All of these, all of the behavior, the underlying behavior was already covered by criminal law, right? And by state criminal law. And then you had these state sentence enhancement statutes recriminalizing, sort of going through the code. We'd run out of conduct to criminalize. We'd go back and we'd recriminalize or, or enhance the, the criminal uh, uh, penalties of, uh, of some of the, uh, of the crimes. Maybe that also reflects part of the, of the uh, spirit of the uh, times of mass incarceration and seeing criminal law as more and more uh, central to the way that we govern ourselves. So what motivates these, uh, these crimes, uh, uh, these uh, the hate crime laws? So I'm, I'm a criminal law guy, if that was a good comment. Already about a life in crime. I look at this as a criminal law person, not as a con law person, not as a person who works in uh, in uh, race and law and, and stuff like that. So what motivates this to me was simply uh, uh, symbolic politics. So I mean, these, this is this is all about symbolic politics and uh, trying to 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 win a victory. In, in the culture of wars, right? And uh, the politicians are only too happy to engage in this and to add their voice to it, and nobody is more opposed to hate crime than I am. I'm with you, right? I can't stand vicious hate crimes, and uh, that's not a difficult position for politicians to take, and it doesn't cost any money uh, either doesn't cost any money <laughs> to the politicians. In some ways, I think this, this was a substitute for you know, the hard work of institution building in tolerance. Um, I should have said at the outset, uh, maybe I don't even need to say, I mean, I'm not in favor of hate crime. I'm not in favor of crime. I do I need to say that I'm not in favor of victimization or people hurting each other. Right? So I mean, you know, that's 
not my concern here. Um, uh, and so we could ask, you know, so what, what is wrong with these uh, statutes? And that, that's a fair question. <coughs> I want to first say uh, that they were unnecessary from a criminal law uh, standpoint. So I'm going to just establish that point. Uh, crime, first of all, as every criminologist knows, is an intra-racial phenomenon. Right? So if, if maybe these laws paint the pictures of one group as attacking and, and, and uh, uh, oppressing another group violently and so forth, that is not the case of crime in America. Crime in America is an intra, at least on the racial side, the ethnic side is intra-racial. So if you're looking at an African-American victim of a violent crime and you say, well, who, who's done this? I mean, 90% of the cases, it would be an African-American perpetrator. And the numbers are somewhat pretty, pretty similar for uh, European Americans, for Hispanics, uh, the same way. So violence is an intra-racial, right? And, uh, and when it's not intra-racial, it, it doesn't fit the, the picture of the, of the, of the white uh, power structure kind of oppressing minority groups, so the white offenders as minority victims. That's not, that's not the reality. The reality is members of both groups, all groups, having fights and attacking each other. Right? Of course, proponents of the hate crime laws will say, well, yeah, that may be true, but when you have a member of the white majority who commits a crime against a minority person, that's likely because of their racial uh, bias. But when you have a member of the minority who robs a member of the majority, that isn't a bias against the victim, it's just a property crime. That's the kind of arguments that go back and forth, and which in the beginning kind of got, which got my attention to the hate crime issue. I struck me as kind of humorous trying to figure out what the what the mindset is of the common criminal element of all uh, backgrounds and, uh, and races, and uh, and maybe what's more serious is trying to assess where we stand as a country from. Uh, teasing out what are the what are the motivations and biases of our criminals. I mean, it's one thing to to try to assess where we are as a country by teasing out the biases and prejudices and values of our leaders and of those who who are in power uh, and, and 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 exert a great deal of influence and control over the society and distribution of its goods and services and opportunities. Another thing to try to measure it by the most sociopathic elements of the society, and, so, and then to generalize from that and condemn the society as being intolerant or whatever. So there was no, and my second point was that I want to assert here is that there's no epidemic of hate crimes. Southern Poverty Law Center and others come out with this is an epidemic of hate crimes. All oh, this is nonsense. I think I think the, the facts show that we have become a more tolerant society. Certainly over the last 20 years, all kinds of violent crime has come way down. And uh, the slow, hard work of tolerance building, I think, has, uh, has uh, moved uh, forward, has moved forward a, a great deal. Um, and uh, the, the business about epidemics is all, you know, I mean, it paints a very negative and a very distorted picture of where we sit uh, as, a, as a country. Um, and the third point, uh, I think, is that there is, no, there is no criminal justice problem for which hate crime laws and sentence enhancements are a necessary solution. So if you say, well, hey, let's say they fill a need, but what's the need to punish people more? We already punish people a lot 
we punish people a tremendous amount. If there's one, if there's one fault that we Americans do not have, it's our inability and unwillingness to punish people. We have tremendous punishment resources. So in New York, for example, the, the punishment for uh, graffiti is a uh, is a maximum of one year in jail. The punishment for vandalism is a maximum of four years in jail. Uh, of course, for serious violent crimes, it, it makes no sense at all to talk about enhancing the sentence, enhancing the sentence for brutal uh, rapes and brutal assaults and murders. These are already astronomical sentences. So to talk, to talk about enhancing them, I mean, how how, how, could they be, how, how much more can they be enhanced? Um, in fact, very interestingly, uh, hate crime has turned up as, a, as an aggravating factor in a number of death penalty states, right, so that it enhances uh, the uh, uh, status of a, of a murder into a capital murder if the bias is uh, one, one of the... Uh, one of the prohibited biases. That too struck me as a, as a kind of uh, uh, irony that in the name of, of enhancing tolerance, we're going to uh, uh, execute uh, uh, the intolerant. Anyway, you might want to think about that. You might want to think about, yeah, to think about, uh, about that. Um, and I, what I did, what I wanted to say again, and what I said about intra-group and intergroup, the exception to that is is men aggressing against women. So if you're talking about violence against women, you're talking about a group, a victims group that is that is uh, aggressed upon uh, by overwhelmingly by men. You want to look at inter-crime as intergroup conflict. That's where you see. Where you see the most intergroup conflict. Okay. So, why? I don't think that the hate crime laws uh, are needed, and I don't think they add anything. I, I don't think they, they do anything. So, you can punish people more. What does that do in, in a positive way? Does that help victims? So unlike anti the anti-employment discrimination, which gives people opportunities to rent or buy uh, housing, or unlike uh, uh, affirmative action and, and breaking down uh, discrimination to get into colleges, which gives people an opportunity to get an education, uh, the hate crime laws do not directly provide a benefit to victims. Uh, by punishing their offenders more. At least I would say, I would, that doesn't do anything for a particular victim, uh, unless, of course, it, it provides more deterrence and would overall uh, reduce the amount of victimizations of that group, uh, which I think is probably unlikely, in as much as the punishments are so severe to begin with. Uh, let me just stop to emphasize this point. Whenever I discuss hate crime laws, people talk about the Matthew Shepard case. Right? They talk about the case in, 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 in Texas, uh, in Jasper, Texas, and murder cases. Like Look at those cases. And, and you know, they're horrible. I mean, they are, they're horrible. They're unspeakable. They're, un they're, 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 they're horrific, right? But the hate crime laws don't add anything to the prosecution and punishment of those offenders. So Matthew Shepard's offenders they were apprehended, they were charged with capital murder, and they were only spared the death penalty because Matthew Shepard's parents uh, uh, said they were anti-death penalty and they asked the prosecutor not to go, and the prosecutor said, okay, I'll abide by your wishes. They got life imprisonment, the same with the guys who Jasper, Texas. The hate crime laws don't uh, don't bite on the on serious crime. Where they really where they could kick in is on minor crime. You can say, oh, a minor crime. Nobody takes it seriously. Some kind of an assault. Uh, some kind of a 
fight and it would be treated as, uh, as a misdemeanor, but if we can rev it up into a hate crime, we can, or if we, we or a vandalism hate crime, we can put some jail time uh, onto people uh, who, who ordinarily would not have gotten any jail time. Thus, another uh, irony is that in the name of creating a more tolerant society, we put more people into jail who, uh, and the jails being the cauldron of intolerance and the breeding grounds of intolerance in the society and put them there in order to make for a more tolerant uh, society. Um, I think not only are the hate crime laws, uh, they don't add anything, um, but I think they're also counterproductive. And this might be more, uh, more speculative on my part, but I think they they politicize a, a crime um, and and thereby uh, divide us uh, on a on an, in an area where we were uh, previously united. So no matter what people's backgrounds, no matter what they what they what their group identity in the olden days, you know. Any reasonable person could get angry about crime and could be angry about criminals. There wasn't all that much to fight about. But we found something to fight about. If we could call, whether we could call it a hate crime or not. And I started, when I got interested in this in the late 80s, I started reading in the papers of groups demonstrating and so forth. They wanted certain crimes called a hate crime. And, crime, and other groups, well, this isn't a, a hate crime, this is an ordinary crime. No, it's, it's got to be called a hate crime. They weren't satisfied that it just be prosecuted as an ordinary crime. They wanted it denounced and prosecuted as a hate crime. It gave us yet another uh, uh, area in which we could uh, do battle along the sensitive socio-political uh, divides of American of American society. So I think that was very counterproductive. Creates a, uh, the hate crime laws kind of create a hierarchy of like victims and they get people into or competing for, okay, you know, we may be all victims, I understand that, but my victimization is more important and, and more significant than your victimization and our victimization is worse than your. You know, and, and obviously people are going to resent that. What do you mean you're a victim? Look at this person. Look at that. I mean, they're all victimizations are very bad, and uh, some of the uh, some of the victimizations based on prejudice are horrible. Some are not that horrible. They come out of fights between people over parking spaces or on basketball courts that escalate into into bad words and, uh, and, and so forth. Some are among gang members. Most of the hate crimes that, that, are, that, are, that are charged uh, involve young people, teenagers, and most of this is juvenile crime, which, which means that it doesn't actually get prosecuted as a hate crime, but it's, it's, it can be arrested and treated as a hate crime, but most of it is among young people and disaffected, disaffiliated, alienated, screwed up young people in the teens and sometimes in the 20s, but if you have in your mind, you know what these hate crimes are about, they're about getting the, the head of the neo-Nazi party for planning a genocide against Jews or African Americans, that, that's not in any case that's ever arisen, that, that doesn't happen, that doesn't come up there, they, they, like nine out of ten of these are, are just messed up people that are not part of a campaign or a, a group or not, not, not Trying to to put forward an ideology, right? Just 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 screwed up, screwed up criminals. I'm going to stop in five minutes. We're almost done. We can't take it. It's going to be five more minutes. Also, these are used against minority offenders a lot. As much as they're used against whites for victimizing blacks, they're also used used against blacks for victimizing whites. It's also quite different than the employment discrimination paradigm and the, and the uh, break, and, and breaking down discrimination in, in education and so forth. I mean, this can be used, ironically, again, 
as, as often against minority offenders as against majority people who are um, in the majority. Uh, and that has led some people to say, well, that wasn't what was intended, right? It shouldn't cover you know, minority uh, offenders' prejudices against whites or women's prejudices against men. It should only go the other way around. That would, you know, hasn't flown at all. All the statutes are in that way uh, race blind and religious blind, and they can be used uh, against uh, uh, to prosecute offenders of any background. Um, and as I said before, it, in a way, lets politicians work the hook. They love to do this. Nobody's more opposed to hate crime than I am. You know, I challenge anybody. You know, denounce it more. And, you know, there's a tremendous escalation of, uh, of language. Um, and finally, uh, we don't need a federal hate crime statute. Uh, uh, for the years, like, why do we need a federal hate crime statute? Uh, when Eric Holder was uh, brought, uh, came into the Senate and he was asked uh, by the Republicans, I mean, do you have some cases that? Should have been prosecuted, that would be prosecuted by the feds that were not prosecuted by the states. He, he couldn't come up with any examples. I, I don't have any examples, but we need to have it, you know, like in case and so forth and so on. So, I mean, this is a solution in search of a problem. I mean, I mean is, this, is this an FBI issue? Is this something we want to bring the FBI into uh, to deal with a uh, with a, uh, a, a, uh, an incident of, of bias or, or hate crime. Uh, I think it may be a misuse of federal criminal resources, but I don't think it will be used very much. And in fact, I'll just leave you with this thought, the hate crime statutes were not passed to be used. They were passed to be admired. Uh, and as long as they were admired, uh, you know, and, and politicians, look at what we produce. It's like artwork. And say this is beautiful stuff, right? What have we achieved? I think some of the some of the one of the presidential races. What we've achieved is that you know the federal hate crime law. I mean, look at it; it's beautiful, and it's not meant really to be used very much. If it is going to be used, uh, it can create a lot of divisions. Um, it also can create problems for jury trials if it gets that bar and jurors start to think about, hey, wait a minute, this isn't just a case about whether A hit B over the head and like, hey, just stick to the facts. I mean, this is a, this is a, this is a case about intergroup uh, conflict and the intergroup politics. And this guy is maybe being made a fall guy for somebody's political agenda and uh, it may become much harder to convince a jury in a multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multi-everything uh, society to vote unanimously uh, to convict the person uh, when you're trying to paint it as a, uh, uh, as, as a biased black person. So basically, that's some of my overarching views.
This reasoning why you did that is important when we consider how wrong it was to act. And did someone kill the great to talk out of one heart simply because of your belonging to a certain group, some immutable characteristic? We know it's really very, very wrong. But don't you think there must be at least a narrow law that would cover uh, this particular segment of crimes when the crime is committed only because you are part of the so the, uh, the, you know, the, there's a causal uh, issue on, on, in all the hate crime statutes, right? So the crime has to be committed because of this prejudice or on account of this prejudice. The federal law and most of the state laws say in whole or in part because of the prejudice. So that means in part. Well, in part, you could say uh, uh, plausibly any crime committed by people from different backgrounds is in part, right? every crime committed by a man against a woman is in part, right, could be explained by the, by the, uh, by the prejudice, uh, by the prejudice factor. Okay, number two, it, it, it's, it's very difficult to tease out, you know, somebody's prejudice and what role it played in a particular crime, uh, unless, you know, they, they've written a string of things, and even then, they're going to say, well, you know, I wrote all that stuff, but the underlying issue was something, was something else. So, they would be considerably narrowed if, if, if the test was, that they would not be applied unless the crime was, was completely motivated or or substantially motivated, but, but the way it's defined is motivated in whole or in part. And then you, but you ask another question, you sort of say, well, isn't that more serious? So we can test your own intuition. Right? Would you say that a, a woman who is raped uh, uh, because uh, she's just a target, it, it, it's worse if she was raped because uh, of her, uh, was wearing a veil and was Muslim? Uh, I think the more serious the crime is, the less significant the motivation is, right? But at the shallow end, you might say, well, it makes more of a difference. And suppose if we're talking about vandalism and you vandalize somebody's car and you paint it all over it, but it, 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 and it was uh, just a, you know, an expressive uh, you know, thing among gang members, or on the other hand, you painted a swastika on it. So this is a, a, from a Jewish family, and so you put a swastika. Is that worse? And if it is worse, how much worse is it? And of course, there you also get into the uh, into the First Amendment uh, area uh, about uh, are you are you punishing there for having the wrong opinion? And the courts have said no, that's okay to do that, but still you wonder. You know, you're holding the wrong, the wrong values. You, you don't agree with, uh, with uh, you know, the, uh, the socially sanctioned viewpoint. So if you put, you know, down with the help, you know, as graffiti, you know, the, 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 you know, the, 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 the Pope uh, uh, and, and Catholics are getting in the way of women's rights or something, is that a worse crime? than just plain graffiti. I would prefer, I, I don't see why we need to go down this road. And I, so I'll again step back and say, is there somebody out there that you think isn't being punished adequately? Other people, my, the critics, my critics come back and they say, that's not the issue. We don't care whether people are being punished adequately. We want certain kinds of offenders to be punished more. No matter how much the others are punished, we want you to make that distinction and punish the hate crime offenders more to, to create that distinction. So, I don't know, is that, uh, is that a good idea? Is to, uh, just to create that distinction? It, it, to, to me, as a criminologist, I mean, the funny thing is we spend all this time getting people into jail and prison for as long as we can. And then there's a huge uh, 
had mechanisms about getting people out of prison, right? I mean, we look at the mess we've made with that over-incarceration, so we have a tremendous you know, mechanism trying to somehow find ways to shorten the stays and get the people, and cut down the sentences and get the people out of prison. Yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah. I was going to say, there was, um, you mentioned earlier, like, okay. Well, if I follow that, I, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I mean, the Supreme Court has said that uh, you can punish. Uh, 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 I mean, hate crime laws, as as enhancement statutes, are okay, even if you're only choosing certain prejudices and not all prejudices. Right? I mean, that's uh, you know, there's a seems to me a substantial issue there. I mean, you, maybe you can say, look, as long as if there's prejudice involved, you want to get an enhancement, but if it's just certain prejudices, uh, maybe this should be a question. I'm not a constitutional law guy. I mean, I, you know, all they do is balance things. I, mean, uh, I don't know if they come up with an answer to balancing. I, I don't get that really, but they've approved that. So, uh, you know, I, I think now there's not a constitutional uh, barrier. Uh, the, you know, I, I don't get you to keep a list of all of the times in which people have called for prosecution on the basis of, of, of a hate, to make it into a hate crime case. There are not that many of these cases that are actually brought. More are called for in the community uh, by some group or individual. But very, very few of these are linked to people with a, some kind of strong organizational, you know, affiliation, you know, like the Federalist Society, you know, or something. The Federalist Society attacking the time, it was the, the Constitutional Society, or something like that. It's I think, mostly, I think we'll be all right. mostly prejudiced individuals. Mostly, I would say the vast majority of cases are prejudiced individuals. And when you look at the individual, I mean, it'd be nice to think, oh, here we have a classic you know, biased individual, but you know, these individuals like the guy in Tucson uh, tend to be very screwed up individuals. And the closer you look, the more screwed up they uh, they appear. So, and again, as I said, the, 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 the you know, I want to keep pushing you to think about, I mean, is the problem that the existing laws just aren't tough enough? And what the problem we have in America is we, we just don't punish a certain kind of offender seriously enough. We, we don't have enough law on the books, and, and that created a need, and we filled the need with these hate crime laws. Do you think that is what the story is? I would say that that's just simply not the story. I mean, you look again at the statutes, they, they have so much capacity to punish people. You know, you start out with, the, I used to say this teaching criminal procedure, sometimes students say, well, you know, I don't know if I could, could represent a guilty person. I said, look, let's start with this person committed a crime, but the prosecutors come in and they say, look, I'm sorry to tell you, 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 you had some misconduct, it violates four statutes. Each statute, there are, there are five counts. We have 20 counts uh, against you. Here, each count carries a 10-year a, a maximum, so by our rough calculation, you're facing 200 years in prison. I mean, that's what happens in a lot of our criminal cases. You know, you're facing massive punishment. And so do we need more? Yeah, it seems like the main use of, uh, the main benefit of hate crime legislation is not to increase punishment or any of those things that you said, but what about just 
if it has a benefit, what about just the benefit that hate crime legislation serves to express solidarity yeah. between us as a, as a society? That you know we are against certain yeah. things, and we're willing to say that publicly and to agree on it dem democratically. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly it. It's all about that. Is 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 expressing solidarity with with victims. And uh, it, I mean, if people recognize that that's what it was, uh, of course, you wouldn't need hate crime laws. People, leaders, could come up and you could make these pronouncements and so forth. But better than pronouncements would be some hard work in institution building. In, uh, in tolerance, right? rather than just to pulling out our old weapon of the criminal law and you know increasing the punishment. But I think that's right. Mostly, it's just expressive, and and people talk a lot about sending messages. Right? There's a lot of messages whirling around, and I, I wrote an article about this once in the hate crime law. And I mean, who is the message recipient? Right? Are you telling the the would be offender? You know, you should be a you know a more equal opportunity offender. You should know that you know offending on the basis of these categories is utterly and you know incredibly unacceptable. But you know they already know the position of mainstream America. So I, I think that the, that the message receiver are really the the advocacy groups that need to produce results for their constituents. Every year, they've got to show that they have produced a result. This legislation is a result, and it really is saying to the advocacy groups, you know, here's what you want, here's what we're going to give you. Uh, to give you the media of this legislation. saying, the defendant was saying uh, that I am homophobic and it's because this triggered my prejudice, right, I should be less responsible. So I think that's really interesting because it turns the whole hate crime thing around. Instead of you being more responsible for being homophobic, right, you become less responsible, like the abuse excuse. So, you know, you can say, look, I grew up and it was drilled into me that homosexuals are bad, that homosexuality is, is horrible, and uh, what do you want from me? I mean, I'm just responding to my uh, to my prejudice. So you can say the same thing about, uh, you know, lots of groups. I grew up thinking about the Israeli-Palestinian uh, uh, issue, you know, and this, and we were right, and they were wrong, and, uh, you know, once I saw this guy, and he looks like a Palestinian, or he looks like an Israeli, then he clashed. Uh, does that make you more culpable or less culpable? I mean, I like to think that I wouldn't use it either way. I would like to think I wouldn't use it either way. So, uh, I, I don't think you would be able to rely on your prejudices to create a, uh, a, a, a less culpable. That, that really is, that's a great point. <laughs> I should have put this in. You know, into my, into my talk, right? Sort of stands the whole thing on its head. Yeah. I'm wondering how you feel about um, hate um, speech being perpetrated on the internet by yeah. the like high school students and the social networks, and whether there's how do you feel with that if hate is not effective or hate criminalization is not effective right. generally? How do you deal with the new type of hate? I should have said that in the beginning. You know. When you know, sometimes you see the talk about hate crime, and people think it's going to be about hate speech, and I disappoint them because I don't talk about hate speech, and hate speech on campus, and hate speech on the internet. So I don't deal with hate speech because it is not criminal, and because the First Amendment is a is a barrier to criminalizing that kind of speech. And I myself, uh, I like to think of myself as a as a very strong First Amendment supporter, uh, and uh, you know, e even in the face of, uh, of really obnoxious and abhorrent uh, speech, I, I think we, we, whenever we've gotten away from 
from really doing the line on the First Amendment in this country, we, we, we've gotten in trouble. We've gone down bad uh, roads. And I, so I, I don't know about for other countries where they do criminalize some kind of free speech. I think for us, it's a, it would be a mistake to start picking out certain kinds of speech and, and, uh, and criminalizing it and prosecuting people. Then they would change, they could change their messages, and then they would become martyrs, you know, First Amendment speech martyrs and so forth. And I, I just don't, and, and how would you decide what is hate speech and what isn't hate speech? Where would you draw the lines and who would draw the lines? Uh, I, I don't want to go down that road. So that means uh, we have to tolerate a lot of people who have more in their speech. And I think that's, uh, that's uh, what we are. In society, uh, uh, we, we, we tolerate the Nazis uh, marching in Stoke and we tolerate a lot of hate speech on the internet. That being said, I, you know, if, if, if there's a way that the internet providers can shut down sites, uh, I'm okay with that. Because it, it, that doesn't bother my criminal law side. You know, you know, so if they can figure out ways to shut down certain sites and have certain standards and decorum uh, on the internet, uh, I think that's probably okay, although maybe think about it as I'm standing here. I don't want a lot of censorship. Uh, I don't want to say that there are certain opinions which are too important to be uh, being voiced on the, uh, on the internet. I think there should be. I mean, the Jewish background, I uh, uh, example of somebody wants to say there should be no Israel, you know, the Jews should be eliminated. I, I think, you know, I, I, I don't think people should be taken off. Is that hate speech? Or even imagine variations on that would, would be uh, would, would be very uh, very I don't know, it's a long winded answer, but my and I don't think we should we should criminalize uh, uh, hate speech on campus and so forth. But you know, I, I think we ought to uh, we ought to have uh, statements of tolerance, especially by the leadership. You know, keep the keep the values uh, front and center. And no reason not to denounce those who who uh, violate those uh, those values. Final question, anyone? Thank you all. Thank you very much, Professor Jacobs. Um, the Federal Society is going to return next week. We're going to have a debate on Wednesday, the 26th, at, scheduled for 4 p.m. between Professor uh, Carlos Gonzalez of Rutgers University, Newark, and Professor Earl Marks Maltz from Rutgers Camden School of Law. What an interesting uh, turnpike series there. <laughs> um, most likely at 4 p.m. We will also have an organizational meeting next week most likely Tuesday at 12.35, but I'll send out an email and let you guys know for sure. Um, then one final thing, uh, we are scheduling our trip to the National Federal Society Symposium at the University of Virginia on uh, February 25th to 26th. Um, if you are interested in attending, please contact me as quickly as possible. All right, well, thank you very much. Bye.